So good afternoon um, to those of you in the UK. Good evening to anyone in the Far East. And I don't know if there's anyone joining us from the US or anywhere like that. Good morning to you. It's really great to have a global audience here to hear these three distinguished speakers from Singapore talk about the corporate restructuring initiatives that are likely to have consequences all over the world, though obviously we're focusing today on, on Asia. And um, I, as I'm sure many of you who are, know about it will agree that restructuring and insolvency law is always, of course, important, but it has become much, much more significant in the last year, even more significant because of the economic effect of the pandemic. And of course, the pandemic is a, is a global phenomenon, so it affects everyone around the world. And the two projects that are subject to today's presentation, um, I think they both predate the pandemic, in, at least in their planning stages, and, and they are the result of the vision of, amongst others, two of our speakers today. So first, we're going to hear from Justice Canon Ramesh to talk about the Age and Principles for Business Restructuring project. Um, this is a project which is jointly undertaken by the Asian Business Law Institute and the International Insolvency Institute, um, I heard about it as uh, um, because of the, I'm a member of the International Insolvency Institute, as I think one or two of our interdees are, and um, I became a little bit involved in this project through III. So we're delighted that Justice Ramesh is able to be with us to talk about that. Um, after a distinguished career in practice in Singapore, he became a Judicial Commissioner in 2015 and a Judge of the High Court of Singapore in 2017. Um, and but he, not only is he a judge, but he's very active in, in law reform um, and, and in the global discussion about insolvency and restructuring. So Justice Ramesh is going to kick off. We're then going to hear from Dr. Aurelio Gurea Martinez. Um, Aurelio is an assistant professor at SMU, Singapore Management University. He studied in Spain, Oxford and Stanford. I got to know him when he was at Oxford. And he's going to talk about the work of another restructuring initiative in Asia, the Singapore Global Restructuring Initiative. And he founded that at Singapore Management University uh, last year. So he's going to talk about what he's been doing there. And then we have um, to comment on both of these presentations. We have Mr. Sushil Nair. And Sushil is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of Drew and Napier and also heads up its corporate restructuring and workout practice group. That's all in, in Singapore. Um, he chairs the Insolvency Subcommittee of the Law Society of Singapore and he was named Singapore's Restructuring Lawyer of the Year 2019. So we, with our distinguished speakers, I hope there'll be time for some questions and discussion after the presentation. Just a few nuts and bolts instructions. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, um, I don't know if you can raise your hand, but I think I think you're meant to put it in the Q&A and then I can call upon you there. Um, and what we will do is, um, uh, unless you don't want to, we'll make you a panelist so everyone can see you when you ask your question and make your comment. So that's my all I'm going to say um, by way of um, introduction. And now I'd like to hand over uh, with many, many thanks to Justice Ramesh. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you very much for the warm introduction, uh, Luis. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone. I am grateful for the kind invitation from Professor Gallifer and Dr. Sefak to join you today for this presentation on an important project of the Asian Business Law Institute, or ABLE for short, and the International Insolvency Institute. While physical borders remain largely closed due to the pandemic, that I'm able to join all of you in the United Kingdom and from other parts of the world, from Singapore, despite the time difference and global separation, speaks to the fact that our borders have never been more open. Cross-border collaboration has never been easier thanks to technology and our common desire to stay connected. We must continue to leverage technology and harness our collective will as the pandemic unfortunately still has some legs to run. International cooperation and collaboration are important, if not essential ingredients in achieving effective solutions in cross-border insolvency. Fragmentation in philosophy and approach results in inconsistent decisions and compromise in unproductive outcomes. This goes against the grain of international comity, which is at the heart of modified universalism, so eruditely expressed by Lord Hoffman in HIH and many other of his judgments. Ancetral realized the importance of reducing fragmentation very early on and anchored its efforts on modified universalism. Working Group 5's sterling reform work 
has resulted in the formulation of seminal instruments such as the 1997 model law on cross-border insolvency. It would not be an overstatement to say that Working Group 5's work has done much to facilitate a common foundation for the resolution of cross-border insolvencies. However, much more is needed. Solutions are required to meld our philosophies and iron out our differences so that insolvencies are resolved on a common footing. How do we do this? It seems self-evident that convergence in philosophy and approach is key. For this to happen, the principles and ground rules must at the very least be similar. While the model law is a step in this direction, as pointed out in Rubin and Eurofinance, it is a procedural tool only. As such, it is not designed to synchronize philosophies and can only take us so far. I submit that it's our collective responsibility as members of the global insolvency community to walk down the path of convergence. Globalization demands that we do. It is a fact that globalization has caused a paradigm change in the global economic order. Trade and investments flow across borders and economic zones largely seamlessly and unfettered. Whether we end up with a unified world economic order or a bipolar US-China world order, as BlackRock suggests in a report released last week, or for that matter, some other option, globalization in some shape or form is here to stay. Asia is a case in point. The Asian growth story has been written on the back of the phenomenal growth in trade and investment flows into and out of Asia and within Asia. Much ink has been spilt on analyzing the economic ramifications of the Asian growth story. Perhaps less has been spilt on considering whether Asia's legal architecture has kept abreast with the pace of its economic change. It cannot be gainsaid that economic growth needs to be allied with the regeneration of the legal landscape to be sustainable in the long term. This then is the backdrop for the project which I will share with you today, the Asian principles for, of business restructuring. The seeds of the project were sown in 2016 when the ABLE was launched in Singapore. The ABLE's mission is the removal of, and I quote, unnecessary or undesirable differences between Asian legal systems that pose obstacles to free and seamless trade, unquote. The ABLE seeks to achieve this by, and I quote again, initiating research with a view to providing practical guidance in the field of Asian legal development and promoting the convergence of Asian business laws, unquote. The ABLE was therefore the right platform for the project. At the same time, it was important that the ABLE found an outstanding thought leader to partner. In the IIII, the ABLE found that partner. That the project was therefore born. It is gratifying that so many legal luminaries, such as Professor Gallifer, from all over the world, Asia included, have accepted the invitation to contribute to the project. Their support is a ringing endorsement of the mission of the project and the di direction the ABLE and the IIII have taken. Let me say a, say a little bit more about the conception of the project. Insolvency is often associated with images of collapsed businesses, lost jobs, distraught families, and other societal and economic disruptions. Sadly, these unfavorable images have only been reinforced by the pandemic. Just last week, I read with sadness the appointment of the offshore receiver as liquidator of Debenhams, a 243-year-old institution in England. The economic malaise and social upheaval that insolvency causes needs to be managed by an effective insolvency process. A proper insolvency regime plays a critical long-term role in driving economic development by ensuring that a country and indeed a region is attractive to investment. Private investors are more drawn to regions where the rules are predictable, transparent, and broadly consistent across jurisdictions as they have the assurance of a fair and efficient exit in a multi-jurisdictional workout. Without convergence, there's a real risk of jurisdictional arbitrage. A large number of international organizations are dedicated to addressing this issue, such as Working Group 5, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, Insol International, and the IIII, to name a few. This signals a desire to reduce, and where possible, remove fragmentation and insolvencies. The case for convergence is particularly compelling for Asia. Based on, based on ADB estimates, 
Asia will need US 1.7 trillion in investment every year until 2030 in order to maintain a strong growth momentum, respond to climate change, and tackle poverty. ASEAN's total infrastructure needs alone are estimated to be around US 2.8 trillion from 2016 to 2030, or an annual requirement of 184 billion US dollars, equivalent to 7% of ASEAN's GDP in 2016. There is therefore a huge investment gap that awaits filling by private investors who may choose to watch and wait rather than invest if there isn't a consistent framework for exit in distressed situations. Over the years, many of the multilateral organizations mentioned earlier have made tremendous progress on this march to harmonization. Two examples come to mind. I've already mentioned the outstanding work of Working Group 5 in formulating seminal model laws. Working Group 5 is presently developing an insolvency framework for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, a necessary development in my view to address the unique challenges posed by the insolvencies of MSMEs. In October 2016, the Judicial Insolvency Network was formed to facilitate court-to-court -court communication and cooperation and introduce best practices in cross-border insolvency cases. Many Asian judiciaries are represented in the gym. In the gym. This is a big positive. However, much work remains to be done. And in the case of Asia, the need is pressing. It is for this reason that the Board of Governors of the ABLE decided in 2016 that insolvency and restructuring was a project topic that merited serious pursuit. The board also felt that international expertise was crucial. Following detailed discuss discussions with the leadership of the III, the project was conceived. As his name suggests, the project has as its ultimate aim, the issuance of a set of principles or shared best practices or guides that cover both in-court and out-of-court workouts. The Asian principles, as I shall call them, are meant to be a reference tool for judges and practitioners, as well as legislators, regulators, and policymakers in the Asia Pacific region on a suggested common philosophy and approach to insolvency workouts. The ABLE formed an advisory committee and a working committee to guide the project. Professor Gulliver is an advisory committee, by the way. The committees felt that the project should proceed in two phases. A phase one to map the existing business reorganization landscape in Asia, and a phase two to formulate the Asian principles. Phase one was conceived as an understanding of the status quo was regarded as, as necessary before a common approach could be recommended. 16 jurisdictions were identified for the phase one mapping exercise, namely all 10 ASEAN member states, as well as ASEAN's major trading partners, such as the People's Republic of China, India, South Korea, Australia, and Japan, to name a few, just to name a few. The bedrock of phase one was a questionnaire issued in February 2019. The questionnaire was a ma massive undertaking running to over 200 questions covering the full spectrum of issues that arise in a workout. Dr. Paul Omar, who many of you here would know, was its principal architect. He crafted the questions in close consultation with the two committees. The question is available on ABLE's website for download, and I commend it to you for both its depth and as a template for future similar questionnaires. With the release of the questionnaire began the work of drafting reports for each of the 16 jurisdictions. 26 jurisdictional reporters were enlisted, condensing responses to 200 questions in a coherent report complete with footnotes and appendices was a mammoth task. The draft reports were reviewed subsequently by a group of international experts. Thanks to the work of all reporters and the review panel over a 13 month period, phase one saw the publication in April, 2020 of, a, of an 804 page compendium titled Corporate Restructuring and Insolvency in Asia 2020. The jurisdictional reports provide a comprehensive picture of the current regime in each jurisdiction and explain in detail not only the law as written, but also as practice. It is the first publication of its kind for a number of ASEAN jurisdictions 
such as Brunei, Laos, and Myanmar, all of which have recently implemented reforms. The timing of the compendium was opportune as the economic fallout from the pandemic had just started to be felt. The compendium has received considerable interest from Asia and beyond since its release. In September and October last year, ably partnered with Insol's regional hub in Singapore to introduce the compendium to Insol's members in Asia. The release saw very encouraging take up. The publication has also been reported on various media such as LexisNexis blog and the Australasian lawyer. Most recently, the Chief Justice of Singapore, Sundaresh Menon, referred to the compendium in his response to the opening of the legal year 2021 as one of the examples of the work carried out to, and I quote, advance multilateralism and the rule of law, unquote. Just last month, Abley and the III were delighted to learn that a group of young judicial officers from the Shenzhen Bankruptcy Court of the PRC had started work on translating the compendium into simplified Chinese to make it more accessible to readers in the PRC. This is a particularly exciting development as the first specialist bankruptcy court in the PRC, the Shenzhen Bankruptcy Court is at the forefront of developments in insolvency in the country. The fact that young insolvency judges from that court have found the compendium insightful and want to, in their own words, and I quote, introduce overseas practices to the PRC, unquote, bodes well for the goals of the project. The publication of the compendium and the warm reception it has received serve as added impetus to press ahead with the next stage of the project. Phase two promises, promises to be an even more exacting task as distilling and synthesizing the essence of the jurisdictional reports into a set of principles is an ambitious undertaking. Let me explain why. A review of the compendium reveals the diversity in approach taken by the 16 jurisdictions. This is hardly surprising given the different legal traditions of the jurisdictions. Seven are common law, eight are civil law, and the remaining one is a hybrid of the two. The diversity is compounded by the fact that the legal systems of these jurisdictions are in different stages of evolution. I illustrate the challenge with two, and if time permits, three examples. First, out of court workouts. The most common approach seems to be to leave out of court workouts to the parties. There are no legislative or regulatory interventions with the parties free to negotiate any arrangement amongst themselves. The validity of such arrangements is governed by general laws of contract, not insolvency law. In some of these jurisdictions, however, organs of the government or industry associations have taken the step of issuing policy documents or guidelines to facilitate out of court restructuring of corporate debts owed to financial institutions. For example, in Hong Kong, debtors or banks may invoke the Hong Kong approach to corporate difficulties, which is a set of principles governing corporate debt restructurings and workouts involving multiple banks. The Association of Banks in Singapore has similarly issued a set of principles for facilitating out of court workouts through its principles and guidelines for restructuring of corporate debts. The Bank of Thailand, Thailand's central bank, has issued policies on workouts for financial institution creditors as well. The PRC, on the other hand, has issued policy documents focusing on general economic measures and the setting up of bailout found, funds to facilitate out of court workouts. The second category includes jurisdictions where formal legal structures are in place to promote out-of-court workouts. In Japan, the Act on Strengthening Industrial Competitiveness has introduced a regime called Turnaround ADR. This regime facilitates the workout of debts owed to financial creditors by requiring the appointment of a mediator specialized in company turnarounds. Out-of-court restructuring in South Korea has its roots in an agreement called the Corporation Restructuring Agreement, reached by 210 local banks after the 1997 Asian financial crisis. The Corporate Restructuring Promotion Act now regulates such arrangements by enacting into law the workout procedures developed by the financial institutions. At the other end of the spectrum, several jurisdictions have neither, neither any formalized rule nor any guideline or policy document in relation to out of court workouts. Brunei, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam fall into this category. With the termination in 2003 of the Jakarta Initiative, Indonesia also falls into this category. The Jakarta Initiative was a government agency constituted following the 1997 Asian financial crisis, 
to facilitate out-of-court corporate debt workouts. Next, I turn to the issue of recognition of foreign insolvency proceedings and insolvency representatives. The model law, of course, provides the most efficient and certain route for the recognition of foreign insolvency proceedings and representatives. However, only 30% of the jurisdictions studied by the project have adopted the model law. A silver lining is that India is actively considering adopting the model law. The remaining non-model law jurisdictions may be divided into three groups. The first group comprises jurisdictions that lean in favor of the model law or concepts of comity. India and Hong Kong fall into this group. The courts in Hong Kong have a long tradition of recognizing the authority of a foreign regulator appointed in proceedings that are substantially similar to the insolvency regime there. The second group comprises jurisdictions that as a principle do not recognize any foreign proceedings, including foreign insolvency judgments. Indonesia and Thailand are amongst the jurisdictions that fall into this group. The position of the third group is legislation specific. Almost all reporters for jurisdictions in this group pointed out that while the jurisdictions have not adopted the model law and have no clear roadmap to do so, foreign ju insolvency judgments may be recognized according to domestic legislation or applicable bilateral treaties. For example, the PRC recognizes bankruptcy judgments from Italy, France, and Germany based on bilateral treaties. However, bilateral treaties take years to negotiate and the threshold that one needs to satisfy under domestic legislation for recognition is usually high. The divergence in these areas illustrates the challenges that a multi-jurisdictional workout in Asia presents. It also underscores the need for convergence. In the absence of convergence, how will a cross-jurisdictional workout be managed without fragmentation? If cross-jurisdictional workout is a mix of in-court and out-of-court workouts, what principles will apply for the recognition of any voluntary arrangement that is entered into in the former and of foreign insolvency proceedings and representatives in the latter? Without shared principles, solutions may be hard to find. There are, these are just some of the difficult questions that phase two must grapple with. Finally, there is dip financing. Dip financing is important as it offers distressed companies access to working capital while a restructuring plan is developed. Several Asian jurisdictions such as Japan and South Korea recognize dip financing as a common benefit claim that warrants higher priority. However, as a concept, dip financing is unfamiliar to most developing Asian jurisdictions and information on this form of rescue financing, not to mention its practice is thus limited. That being said, a trend is discernible from the jurisdictional reports. Many jurisdictions that have recently implemented varying degrees of law reform have moved dip financing up the priority list to above unsecured creditors in order to encourage post-petition financing. For example, Brunei now allows lenders who furnish unsecured financing after the commencement of insolvency proceedings to enjoy priority over other unsecured creditors. A new judicial interpretation issued by the PRC in 2019 confers dip financing priority over unsecured ordinary creditors. Having principles that address the treatment of dip financing in Asia, including issues of priority and valuation of secured interest may encourage funders to focus on special situation strategies to allocate capital to rescue viable Asian businesses in distress. So how, is, how are we shaping phase two? Several meetings have taken place to discuss the shape of, of the Asian principles. It is important that industry associations such as banking associations and practitioner bodies are consulted during the initial draft review process of the Asian principles so that their concerns and feedback are taken on board. I understand that to this end, the ABD will invite representatives from those associations to be part of a consultative consultation group before road testing the Asian principles with the wider public. I digress briefly at this stage to mention another project that the ABD is undertaking, the Data Privacy Project. Adopting an identical architecture, architecture to the project, the Data Privacy Project focuses on the framework for cross-border transfers of personal data in Asia. This project produced a compendium of 14 jurisdictional reports in early 2018. Last year, a comparative study of those reports led to the publication of a comparative review and table titled Transferring Personal Data in Asia, a Path to Legal Certainty and Regional Convergence, which analyzes both the main differences 
and areas of convergence in Asian laws in the sphere of transfers of personal data. The Data Privacy Project has garnered extensive global interest. Last November, it was selected from 850 submissions from 115 countries to be presented at the Third Paris Peace Forum, an annual conference where heads of states, international organizations, top industry leaders, and nonprofit organizations meet to construct new forms of collective action regarding global governance issues. More recently, the comparative review and table was honored with the Privacy Papers for Policymakers Award by the Future of Privacy Forum, a leading privacy think tank in the United States. This is the first time in the 10 year history of the award that a paper focused on Asian laws has been selected. I mentioned the Data Privacy Project only to illustrate why there's cause for optimism for the project. In conclusion, the pandemic has dramatically changed how most people live and work, perhaps permanently. To those whose work involves insolvency, the pandemic has brought, perhaps brought an added dimension. It has brought the need for reform in insolvency and restructuring into sharp focus. The need for shared principles has never been greater. It is our hope that the Asian principles will make a difference. Once again, thank you very much for having me today. And now it's, it gives me my great pleasure to invite Professor Aurelio Martinez from the Singapore Management University, University to speak about the Singapore Global Restructuring Initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Justice Ramesh, for this kind introduction. I would like also to thank Professor Luis Gallifer for putting together such a fantastic webinar. I would also like to thank my colleague, Professor um, Felix Stefek. Um, so thank you all for being able to join us. I know that some of you are joining us from the United States. Some of you are joining us from Asia, many others from Europe. So thank you all for being able to, to be here with us, sharing a few thoughts about um, the Asian uh, Business Restructuring Project and the Singapore Global Restructuring Initiative, which is what I'm going to talk about. Um, so the Singapore Global Restructuring Initiative is a global platform launched by Singapore Management University's Center for Commercial Law in Asia with the support of the Ministry of Law and we try to achieve four main uh, goals. The first one is to promote cutting edge research and restructuring and corporate insolvency. The second one is to contribute to the local, regional and international debate on corporate insolvency. As Justice Ramesh has just mentioned, uh, we need more research and more policy and academic debates in the region, in Asia, and also in other parts of the world, particularly in emerging economies. So hopefully um, with the work conducted by the initiative, as well as the support of many of the leading practitioners, academic judges and policymakers joining us for this exciting project, we will be able to help regulators and policymakers uh, in promoting this type of discussions. Thirdly, we are also um, planning to promote awareness in the insolvency space because also we have realized that as most of you know, um, insolvency is often understood as a bunch of procedural rules to deal with a financially distressed firm. And of course that's true, but actually the role of insolvency law in the real economy is much broader. In fact, insolvency law can often be more important for solvent company than for insolvent firms because of the ability of insolvency law to affect the way debtors and creditors make decisions. So that's why we want to promote this type of awareness to try to make the business and legal community realize that insolvency law is part of the entrepreneurial system and has a significant role in the real economy. And finally, we thought that this important mission needs to necessarily be conducted in collaboration with all the relevant stakeholders. So that's why even though the initiative has been launched by an academic institution, we have made sure to put together and learn from leading practitioners, from judges, from regulators, and from policymakers from all over the world. So the way to achieve these, uh, uh, these challenging, but also exciting goals is by putting together uh, a fantastic group of insolvency experts from Singapore in our advisory board. 
an advisory board kindly chaired by Justice Ramesh, to whom I would like also to publicly thank for his invaluable support in this exciting mission. Also, we have created an international advisory council comprising leading scholars, prominent judges, and regulators and policymakers from all over the world. And then also we have a group of talented uh, students from SMU interested in pursuing a career in insolvency and restructuring, also supporting our research team. Also, we are creating different alliances. So one of them is with the uh, University of Cambridge Center for Corporate and Commercial Law. So I would like to thank also publicly to Professor Louis Gallifer and Professor Felix Steffek also for their support and the opportunity to work together on several projects. We are also launching with Insol International several initiatives with the Asian Business Law Institute. So that's why we're trying to collaborate with many different stakeholders and institutions. And we are organizing a variety of activities. So we are planning as soon as the COVID-19 crisis allow us to organize something physically, we are planning to organize a major global conference of corporate restructuring where everybody here is very much welcome to join us for this exciting event. We have also created a visiting professorship for a global expert on corporate insolvency to be able to join us and stay in Singapore for a couple of weeks to, to help us contribute to the local and regional debate on corporate restructuring. We are organizing a variety of webinars, seminars, round table, one of them again in collaboration with the University of Cambridge. Um, we have created a blog for insolvency news around the world. Again, I would like to encourage everyone to please contribute to our blog by submitting um, articles dealing with insolvency reforms, new academic papers, um, insolvency decisions, any judgment that can be particularly useful for the local, regional, or international uh, uh, community is very much welcome. And then we are also working on seven research projects. So some of them are also conducted in collaboration with some external uh, colleagues. For example, one of our projects is about comparative insolvency law. So um, uh, Professor Felix Stefek from Cambridge and I are editing a book on comparative insolvency law from uh, an economic and functional perspective. And we have managed to put together a group of experts from Japan, from China, from um, Europe, from uh, the UK, from the United States, from Latin America, and we're working together on that. Also, we are working with some leading practitioners from Singapore, also on another book and a variety of articles analyzing the new insolvency restructuring uh, and the Solution Act in Singapore. We are also working on a variety of projects dealing with SMEs in insolvency, with impact of new technologies on insolvency, also emerging economies, as Justice Ramesh has mentioned, um, um, the Asian uh, business restructuring principles have shown that some of the major weaknesses in the insolvency regimes in the region are found in many emerging economies. And that's probably because these countries still need a more active academic and policy debate. So that's why um, we have decided also to conduct a variety of projects on insolvency law in emerging economies. And in fact, in our website, um, we are uh, publicizing some of the research paper that we have been conducting so far uh, in this space. And finally, we have also been doing some research, of course, because of these unfortunate times, um, we have been doing some research on insolvency and COVID. So in particular, we have focus on how insolvency law can help, if so, to minimize the harmful economic effects generated by the pandemic. And we are also observing how countries are amending their insolvency laws around the world and whether some of these reforms are going to um, uh, be uh, permanently adopted after the COVID uh, pandemic. We have published a variety of blog posts, journal articles, working papers, reports dealing with our work on, on COVID-19 and insolvency, including the report prepared by the World Bank and Insol that I drafted along with two colleagues, one of them from the UK, another one from India. We have also prepared the Singapore report for the World Bank and Insol report on legal and economic measures to support businesses. And we have organized a variety of events dealing with insolvency law and COVID-19 including events where we have been presenting our research on that at the University of Sydney, Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs, Insol International, III, and many others. And what have we found in our research on insolvency law in times of COVID? Well, I think it's important and something that we are observing 
is that we can clearly distinguish two main stages in the COVID-19 pandemic. The first stage where most countries decided to put their economies into hibernation. And in order to do that, some amendments were introduced to their insolvency frameworks, mainly with the purpose of suspending or restricting creditors' rights to initiate insolvency proceedings. This is something that was adopted, for example, in the Asia Pacific region by Australia and by Singapore, among others. Also suspension or relaxation of director's duties and liability in insolvency. This is another temporary reform adopted in Singapore, Australia, and many others. Also the promotion of workouts is essential, not only for the hibernation phase, but also for the recovery phase, not only because the significant costs that can be saved by not initiating formal insolvency and restructuring procedures, but also because we are all overseeing also way of insolvency cases. So that's why it's important also not to overwhelm the judiciary, particularly in some of the emerging countries existing in the region where uh, 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 maybe the, the judiciary uh, doesn't have the level of sophistication existing uh, in other countries, such as Singapore, the UK, um, the United States, and many others. But then, as I mentioned, we are observing a new wave of insolvency reforms. And this new wave of insolvency reforms are more focused on the recovery phase of the pandemic. So these reforms include, again, the promotion of workouts. This is incredibly essential also. But more importantly, we are observing in many jurisdictions in the Asia Pacific region and internationally, the adoption of simplified insolvency framework for uh, micro and small firms. So in Singapore, for example, starting last Friday, we have adopted this simplified uh, insolvency program where small uh, and medium-sized companies can apply for our um, simplified insolvency program. And companies applying for this program will have access, as it happens in Australia as well, to simplified restructuring procedures, which is mainly inspired in our pre-pack scheme. So that's why by reducing some of the costs uh, of the procedure, uh, we can make a, an efficient restructuring tool for SMEs facing financial trouble, but SMEs that are still viable. And also we have adopted a simplified liquidation procedures for those businesses that are no longer viable and therefore they need a quick uh, exit. Um, so in Singapore also these procedures and actually one of the main concerns with SMEs that we have found is how to fund the remuneration of insolvency practitioners and how to fund the procedure itself. So something innovative also that this insolvency program in Singapore has adopted is that the program subsidizes part of the remuneration fee. So that's why this is something that is also very much welcome. So um, as you guys can see, we have a lot of work ahead. We, I, I, I've been just describing one of the uh, many projects that we are currently conducting. And in order to achieve this mission, um, we need your help. So that's why um, please feel free to join us to uh, our events. Feel free to reach out to me for any um, idea for projects, for collaborations. Uh, feel free to submit a blog post because we really need to learn from the international insolvency community. We have a lot of work ahead and that's why um, it's important to have the expertise the feedback and the support of uh, uh, all of you, because I am seeing many leading practitioners, judges, regulators, and policymakers kindly joining us today. So everybody's welcome to this exciting project. Thank you so much, Professor Gallifer, and also Professor and uh, Stefek and Justice Kanan Ramesh. Thank you, Aurelio. And finally, we want to hear from. We're going to hear from uh, Sushil Nair. Uh, and before we have, I hope, some time for some questions. So, Sushil, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Louise, and uh, and I'm very grateful uh, to you for making me a part of this uh, this event and this presentation. Um, it is daunting to follow on presentations made by the likes of uh, Justice Ramesh and Professor Martinez, but I will do what I can. The area of discussion is one which I consider of critical importance to the economic well-being of Asian economies. Asia has become a magnet for investment 
And over the past decade, the FDI levels flowing into Asia as a percentage of global FDI has grown from some 12% in 2003 to 23% in 2017, and is still growing. In 2019, it was at about 30%. And that would be, given that 2020 was the pandemic year, uh, a fair reflection of what Asia could expect in terms of FDI in a normal economic year. Investment into Asian economies remains a cornerstone of the investment stratagems of a number of the larger funds and investment houses. And what is interesting is within Asia, 60% of the investment in Asian economies comes from other Asian companies. So Asia draws global FDI, but also is a major investor in itself with one state investing in the other and no prizes for guessing who the major investor is. Given the substantial amount of investment, it is in the best interest of all stakeholders in Asia's legal systems to work together in a way that minimizes uncertainty for investors, both from outside Asia and from within. The level of investment in Asia can only be enhanced when investors are able to take a view of the level of risk they take when pursuing Asian investments. This is especially relevant now in the face of the current pandemic and the inherent economic issues it throws out. Given the extent of existing investment into Asia, both from outside Asia and from within Asia, it is inevitable that the level of distressed debt and distressed entities will rise. Restructuring regimes in the various Asian jurisdictions will have to deal with the fallout. Speaking broadly, different Asian countries have different roles. Certain states are financial centers with legal and administrative systems that enjoy a certain global trust. Others have significant natural resources and domestic industry that are extremely attractive to investors. For many years, financing is raised in the financial centers and often subject to the laws of those centers and on lent to the entities of the countries with the industries and related resources. So bonds are raised or, or financing subject to the particular jurisdictions uh, taken out and then on lent. Usually you'll have uh, SPVs set up in the financial centers that will be the debtor insofar as the uh, raising of monies are concerned. And that debtor then uh, on lends the monies raised to operating companies, which are in the countries with the raw materials and the countries with the industries. The investors are consistently concerned about how in the case of their investments running into difficulty, a restructuring can be worked out that encompasses the jurisdiction where the money was disbursed to and that where the assets and business is physically located. If we are unable to show these investors a practical way in which a restructuring can be carried out across jurisdictions in Asia without considerable uncertainty, risk and added costs as a result of multiple processes over jurisdictions, the investment climate will suffer. I have dealt with Asian cross-border restructurings involving countries in Southeast Asia, South Asia and North Asia. In many of these cases, we have had to deal with concurrent processes in different jurisdictions with significantly different restructuring regimes. And yet what you're trying to do is get to the same commercial deal. But because you have different uh, regimes and you have regimes that don't necessarily recognize each other with systems that are not harmonized, you're looking to do the same thing in different jurisdictions resulting in increased costs and a degree of uncertainty because you're not sure um, how the different jurisdictions will view the deal that's been put forward. Despite our best efforts and the efforts of the lawyers in the various jurisdictions where we do those cross-border, those cross-jurisdictional restructurings, it, there is always going to be 
a degree of uncertainty. Investors rec recognize this and it is a significant deterrent to investment. It is therefore in the collective interest of all insolvency stakeholders to work together to achieve a degree of certainty in how an Asian cross-jurisdictional restructuring exercise is carried out. The truth is that with the reduction of uncertainty, investment can only increase and that benefits all of Asia. Justice Rubbish is absolutely right when he says that it is our collective responsibility to walk down the path of convergence. This is not going to be a simple process. It will take time and will require a common will from all Asian insolvency stakeholders. But the Asian principles of business restructuring project, the project that Justice Ramesh uh, discussed, is a vital step in the right direction. When one considers the mammoth effort already undertaken to prepare and release the corporate restructuring and insolvency in Asia 2020 compendium, covering 16 jurisdictions, it is clear that there are people with the knowledge and the will to move us down the path where convergence can, over time, take root. There is already much in the Asian culture that is common and consistent with the philosophy of compromise, so necessary for restructuring to work. When there is a clear recognition that convergence and cooperation will inevitably enhance the investment climate for Asian countries, it opens the door for each of us to do what we can to lobby for the various jurisdictions to agree to certain shared principles when it comes to restructuring exercises. As Justice Ramesh has indicated, one such area for consideration is dip financing, an area which could provide significant benefits to all Asian jurisdictions, but which will not succeed on a multi-jurisdictional basis without the certainty that a degree of legal convergence would bring. There is considerable interest in dip financing in Asia from distressed fund players, but they seek security and certainty where they are asked to involve themselves in financing that extends to multi-jurisdictional restructuring exercises. A common set of principles for the treatment of dip finance would encourage players to take a far more significant role in Asian restructuring exercises than they currently do. Dip financing is a critical player in restructuring exercises in the United States. It can have the effect of saving businesses and jobs across the board. Working together on arriving at a common set of principles Asia can tap into this critical resource. I would therefore urge all who have an interest in Asian restructuring to throw your weight behind the Asian principles of business restructuring project. It is an ambitious and important step towards achieving a level of harmony between the restructuring regimes of the various Asian jurisdictions that will stand us all in good stead as a natural haven for investment. On a global scale, Working Group 5 has done so much to put in place a framework for the resolution of cross-border insolvencies. The GIN initiative has also put in place processes to allow for cross-border judicial cooperation with a view to achieving the best possible outcomes in cross-border restructuring exercises. These steps have made global restructuring cooperation a reality. It is time now for all Asian insolvency, stake Asian insolvency stakeholders to step up and work together to help harmonize our restructuring regimes. The project that Rajesh, uh, Justice Ravish has spoken of gives us the path forward. And we should all seize that opportunity and walk down that path together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sushil, and thank you for all our speakers. Um, now, I have one question, but I would um, have just a few minutes at least for questions, so I would 